I, I think that, that Alan has put, has put his finger on something, and that is the extent to which we did or didn't drink the Kool-Aid during this whole idea of everything should be deregulated, the markets can take care of itself. The stories that, that m many of us were doing were, were as Larry has uh, gone through, the, you know, the kinds of things we're covering, the mortgage, we're covering this, we're covering that, we're, we're, we're talking about how you have to d deal with your investments, all this sort of thing. But the missing piece that we weren't covering and that now we're getting around to is the regulation question. And the, I, because it became very unfashionable to say, we ought to regulate this, we ought to cap this, we ought to stop this. The, and, and so the whole notion of, uh, so, so we're, we're doing the, the disclosure, we're covering the kinds of things that we, that we know, we're explaining to people how they work, we're saying, oh dear, this is dangerous. But we weren't, but it was very unfashionable generally to start saying, as an extension of our business coverage, which is all part of, of this regulation, to saying, well, where is the Fed? And are they, are, they could have done something about, under the HOPA law, they could have done something regarding these subprime mortgages. I mean, I, I didn't even know the law. I mean, I wrote a column on it because I found the thing. But, but I happen to be a little biased toward regulation because I think we need a little more of it. And I think that we're going to get that. And we're all going to be writing those stories over the next couple of years. But that, I think, is a pe that, that's where we kind of drank the Kool-Aid, saying the free markets are the best ones, and we're, we're looking at how the markets are working, where the markets are failing. We weren't paying as much attention as we should have to where the regulatory authorities were failing. Now, there was a huge consumer movement back in the 1960s, 1970s, where there was a great deal of activism about regulation, you know, we get seat belts and APRs and you know, truth and savings and all these, these disclosure things that got written as consumer laws. And then the whole consumer movement and the whole regulation idea went away. So now we're coming back, we're talking about the credit cards, we're talking about these other things, what kind of regulation there should be. I, I do think in our coverage that that was a bit of a blind spot and the blind spot came from the fact that in the air is, you know, faith in free markets, faith in deregulation, somehow it would take care of itself. So that's okay. Let me add one little thing to that. Okay, I mean, and that, then I want to go to the sure. audience. Uh, on the risk, of course businesses are supposed to take risks, and we assume that they're supposed to be reasonable. And as journalists, you know, at CNBC, I, I keep picking on them, but why not? They're not here. Why not pick on a stationary sure. target to make sure I hit it? Um, they were purportedly selling news you can use. Instead, what we got from them, as it turns out, was news that will help you lose. <laughs> and if we had a model where everybody could check a box and say, pay $100 and get good financial reporting, it will save you losing 20 years in your IRA, we wouldn't be worried about the future of journalism. But back to Jane, the, the, with Lehman Brothers, they were leveraging these mortgage, these you know, CDO squared, 35, 36 to 1, because the amount of money they had in the till. How could they do that? If we had known that, as you say, by force of regulation or our own efforts, nobody would have bought that stuff. I'm looking out through the lights. Does anyone have a question or a comment? I see somebody up front here. Is there a microphone? He's coming to turn coming. it on. He's coming, right? Help is on the way. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Mimi Whitefield from the Miami Herald. And I'm wondering to what extent the, the panelists um, think that um, the fact that perhaps the public didn't particularly want to be warned about the dangers um, plays into the equation. People were getting rich, at least on, on paper, with their homes. 
Um, it kind of reminds me of what happened during the tech boom. Everybody thought they were a uh, brilliant stock market strategist. Of course, we know what happened with that. Um, to what extent um, did the public not want to be warned of these dangers? Um, uh, Dean? I, I think that's, uh, uh, I, I hear this a lot, and I, I think it's a, um, it's a, um, it's a big mistake to think in those terms, frankly. I, I, um, uh, I think that um, the idea that, the, uh, that your readers were somehow unreceptive to good journalism is, is, uh, is wrong. And I, think I, don't think, I don't think it's supported. I don't think there's any evidence for it. And I also feel like if you want, if you want to get into an argument with your readers, that's okay. I just, I wouldn't, I just don't think that's... I just don't think it, it, it doesn't make sense journalistically or logically, and I think it's also the wrong way to think. Um, readers respond to uh, you know, fact-based evidence, and if you present it to them, they'll get it. I, I think that misses the point, because I don't think anybody stopped writing those stories because readers, some of them, didn't like it, and we got letters. What I think is, what I think it's on the interpretation, we get to the interpretation and not the fact set, is that you could present to readers story after story that there was a bubble they ought to watch out, that these mortgages were bad, and if they're not receptive to it, they're not going to change their behavior. You have to have you change a regulation or a law or whatever. And so, uh, Dean, I don't think anybody stopped writing stories because they were concerned about offending their readers. Right. I right. just think that the readers didn't heed the warnings. That, that, that's what I was getting at. And, and by the way, when, when Greg's point, when when he said, well, maybe we should have been writing more about it because then maybe the government would have responded in some way. I mean, I was just, I love this man. He thinks that we really can make the match. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, this is all of our dream, right? We go into journalism partly to change the world. And, and, and it's very discouraging when you're writing over and over and over again, this is a terrible mortgage, you shouldn't take it, it's gonna kill you, don't do it. And they go ahead and do it anyway. And so, so, there are, you can only move the dial, I think, as journalists when you do get the public behind you, but you can write and write and write and write, and if it is not in their interest to care about what you're saying, they're not going to care about what you're saying. And then they look back, you know, I mean, so much of this is hindsight. And as, as you said, the same thing happened during the, um, during the whole tech thing. You know, I mean, I, I used to sit there at Newsweek and say, oh, you should own some bonds, you know, I was... In fact, my, my friend Alan Sloan is here. There he is. He's laughing already because he used to laugh at me as a bond lady. I was always writing about bonds. And actually, here you are. And uh, it turned out it would have been nice if you'd owned some. But this was, this, these kinds of things are, are uh, you know, people, they learn more from each other, from their peers, from what they feel, because we're appealing to their heads more than they're appealing to their but, hearts. But when you can put on a real estate show and it's a substitute for talking about sex, it's going to have an effect. And nobody believes that they're playing musical chairs and that the music is, what you're telling them, is the music's going to stop. So I, I think Mimi has a point. It was entertaining. People wanted to feel better and feel richer. And you, there's the great power, I know it certainly it worked in my case, uh, of inertia. <laughs> it's easier not to take a chance and sell something that looked like it was going up for a long time. 